Queens and the District City Council representing Alston Brighton. Today is Tuesday, June 4th. Today's hearing is uh, dedicated to public testimony only. Uh, I'd like to remind folks that uh, this is a public hearing. It is being broadcast and recorded on RCN 82, Comcast Channel 8, Verizon 1964, and also streamed at boston.gov backslash city dash council dash TV. I'd like ask folks in the chamber to silence their electronic devices. Uh, as I stated, this hearing is solely for public testimony. There's a sign-in sheet to my left. Uh, we ask that you state your name, affiliation, residence, and please check the box yes if you wish to testify. Today's hearing is on public testimony regarding dockets 0559 through 0563, orders for the fiscal year 19 operating budget, including annual appropriations for departmental operations, annual appropriation for the school department, appropriation for other post-employment benefits, appropriation for certain transportation and public realm improvements, and appropriation for certain park improvements, as well as dockets 0564, 0565, capital budget appropriations, including loan orders and lease and purchase agreements. I'm gonna uh, introduce my colleagues in order of their arrival. To my immediate right, City Councilor at Large Michael Flaherty. To my far left, District City Councilor Ed Flynn. To my immediate left, City Councilor at Large Anissa Sabi George. To my far left, Councilor Matt O'Malley. Again to my far left, Councilors Baker and Councilors Edwards. And to my Far right, Councillor Kim Janey. At this hearing, uh, we are taking, as I said, public testimony. Uh, you'll have three minutes. I will uh, signal 30 seconds left with that signal, and I ask that you wrap it up at that point. I am gonna need, uh, read off three names at a time. So there are about 10, 12 people signed up. Again, I wanna keep to the hard, hard stop and uh, ensure that everybody has their chance to speak at today's hearing. Uh, so the first three speakers are Michael Morrissey, Philomene Laptista, and Kong Chen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, for the record, I'm Michael Morrissey. I live at 111 Lansdowne Street in, in uh, Squanum, the Squanum section of Quincy. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to, to appear. For over three decades, I had the opportunity to serve the people of Quincy and the legislature. I often heard from the people in the city of Boston the acute need for more local aid to support city services. But today, I'm here to ask you to, as Bill Belichick might say, to do your job. Even though Boston, like Quincy, have a strong mayor and a weak council, sorry to say, form of government, it doesn't mean that you can't ask difficult questions when faced with difficult issues. Recently, Mayor Walsh put forth the idea of building a $100 million bridge to support a substance abuse campus on Long Island. As district attorney, I am acutely aware and have an appreciation for the need for beds and direct services. I'd also say that no one does more on the South Shore than the city of Quincy, sober houses, homeless, and transitional housing to help people. As elected officials, we have a responsibility to our constituents in spending tax dollars wisely and supporting development that will not have a detrimental impact. So I ask some of you to ask the question, what is a substance abuse campus? I'm sure I'd get 13 different answers, but no one knows what it is because no one has been told what it is. If the mayor announced the proposal that would call for extensive development, traffic impacts, expenditures of large sums of money in your district, you'd probably be up in arms, especially if there'd been no public hearing, no input, no explanation. Yet, in this instance, I'm here to ask you to take a close look at the proposal that the mayor has made because it needs your vote. And a number of people who are impacted are people, ironically, who can't vote for you. But at the end of the day, the people who are gonna pay for it all vote for you the residents of Boston. So the, the bridge is estimated at $100 million. It'll probably cost a lot more, $150 million, especially after the protracted fight and litigation I expect that will occur. 
uh, it will require um, thousands of dollars in yearly maintenance. And honestly, your track record with last bridge wasn't really too good because we had to take it down because of lack of maintenance. So when you take a look at, at this proposal, you're going to spend $150 million to build a campus, which none of us know what it's going to look like. Or you're talking about renovating buildings that are 60 to 100 years old. What type of program, long-term, short-term, visitors, access, very hard to say, because why? I don't have the answers, and maybe you do, and I hope you do, because I'd love to see and hear them. So there was a study in 2002 by Mayor Menino when we were looking at the future use of Long Island, and lo and behold, that study came back and said intensification of the island would be detrimental because of the limited roadway access to the island through the Squantum community. Now, since that time, We've also cut our own throats and had more development at Marina Bay and in the north end of the city. So uh, I guess what I'm here to argue for you is very simply is climate change and other things have changed. Squantum gets cut off. We don't get out in inclement weather. And if the bridge is here for emergency people, you're going to bring them into the Boston Medical Center. Quincy Medical does no longer exist. Try getting down the expressway during the rush hour or for that matter any time of day. So I ask you to take a look at the alternatives, the cost. Direct service is important. We need them now. But this is going to be a, a protracted battle. And $150 million is at least two-thirds of your expenditures for a bridge not going to direct services. Mr. So Lewis, I just hope that when this proposal up, comes before you, I, that I'm you ask. sorry, but That's I no it. problem. Okay. That, you, uh, that you ask the, the most difficult questions. I'd be happy to answer any questions, Mr. Chairman. Oh. Well, I'd like to keep this as public testimony, but this is, it, I know it affects your district, so uh, let me. First, so I don't know, I'm sure other is people that a, wanna. Anybody else want? Uh, Council Romali. Um, good afternoon, Mr. District Attorney. Uh, I'm curious, do you know of the number of Quincy residents who are currently receiving services in the city of Boston to deal with substance abuse? Um, I don't, but you know the number of people in the city of Boston are receiving services in the city of Quincy. And the answer is I'm sure we're both providing services and we see it every day. Yeah, and... I'm not, I, as you know, I, we don't arrest people now. One of the things, you know, we have a pilot program in uh, Norfolk County. We clearly arrest drug dealers and uh, traffickers, but we find a dealer selling to someone, we're putting them into treatment. We're not bringing them into the court system. So where uh, are you putting them in treatment? Uh, Bay State skills, Bay State counseling. And do we have uh, enough beds for everyone that seeks a bed for treatment? There's not enough beds for everybody. Not nearly enough beds. No, I'm and I, I have to tell you, you know, I, I have some concerns in other aspects of the budget. Um, one aspect that I don't have any qualms about is the 92 or $93 million allocated for the rebuilding of this bridge and Mayor Walsh's desire to create a true recovery campus. Um, I would very respectfully push back on your assertion that there's been no communication with the city of Quincy. Um, Mayor Walsh reached out to Mayor Koch initially when this was first announced. That's right. The night before his inaugural uh, address, he reached yeah. out the day and before. And he had a breakfast meeting subsequently, as recently as May. Um, our chief of streets, Chris Osgood, has been working with the relevant department heads in Quincy. Our intergovernmental relations team has been in frequent communication with Mayor Koch's staff. Uh, Quincy was before the Boston Conservation Commission, and Boston, in fact, is going to the Conservation Commission That's tomorrow. That's right. You approved so. that the same day of the hearing without additional input, but yes, I agree with that. Well, well, but I think that this is a regional approach that needs to be taken. And I understand yeah. the concern. I also understand Well, there's other concerns. Excuse me, sir. You know, being unhappy un about this. But at the end of the day, we need to do something. We need to offer services. We need to offer treatment for these people. We need to be humane, and we need to work together to address this. So I'm proud to stand with Mayor Walsh and his work. And quite frankly, I'm a little disappointed at the, that the, the half-truths and automatic opposition that's coming from many of our neighbors in Quincy. Well, if you want to stand for uh, beds and want to do it soon, you can't even answer for me who's going to pay the program, who's going to run the campus at this time, can you? Well, I think, you know, can, can I just interject, because I, I, I want to move on. That's been another three minutes, Councillor. Last, okay. question. Last I, question. I guess the answer is that there have been plenty of opportunities from the two cities to work together, and I hope they'll continue to work together. 
But at the end of the day, and I appreciate, and, and, and sir, you have a, a terrific record as a Norfolk DA. You're someone who I've known and admired for a long time. You understand that the opiate ec epidemic is affecting every neighborhood. And so for one section to say, we're being NIMBY about this, that's not going to solve anybody. We have to work together. Currently, Quincy residents are receiving treatment in the city of Boston, a lot more than the Boston residents in Quincy. And we need to work to make sure that these people can get the services they need to get clean and get better. It's a public health yeah. issue, and we need to work together. And all I ask, you, all I ask is you look for alternatives, and you, before you go down that path of spending money on a bridge, that you check out other alternatives, let's say like the Shattuck or other alternatives that might be available. It's a lot of money to spend. Uh, Councilor Flynn. Yeah, thank you, Councilor Siomo. I just wanted to follow up. I, Come from this, come to this issue as not as really as a city councilor, but as a probation officer for 10 years, and I supervised the homeless community in Boston for that period of time, and I visited Long Island at least once a week for a 10-year period. And being over there um, weekly, I did see firsthand the amount of incredible work that was done at that at that island, helping people that needed desperately to get clean, to get sober, to get their life back on track. And I've, I've seen so many miracles happen over there, my, f my own family included. And I just, I just support the mayor. I, I do have res great respect for the district attorney, but I do support the mayor because I've seen so many miracles happen at Long Island. It's a, it's a, it's a campus. It'll be structured. It'll be there for the, the, the greater, greater Boston community and throughout the state, helping, helping everyone in need. I think it's critical at this time with this opiate crisis that we do have a strong presence here on, on Long Island, helping people get clean and sober. Thank you. Councilor Baker. Thank you for coming out today, Mr. DA. I was actually at the, um, the meeting at the school in, in, in Squanum, and um, I just want to agree with one thing you said, that Quincy does do more than anybody else on the South Shore. I, I, I absolutely agree with you there. I actually dropped a nephew off at a detox there last Friday night. Um, but I mean, to make this about, to make this about traffic and, and, and those sort of um, arguments that really don't have anything to do with it, we, we're here asking you as a leader in Quincy to, 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 to give this a chance. We're already looking at, um, um, the campus at, at Franklin Park, the, the Shattuck, we're already going to have that operating as a hospital. We need additional beds. We need to do everything we possibly can. We have an opportunity here for when people come out of that initial stage of, of rehab to be able to send them to a, to a place where they're not in their neighborhoods, they don't have to worry about, you know, maybe the dealers tracking them down and, 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 and preying on them, basically. So we're asking you as a leader for, from Quincy to help us do this thing. Don't stand in our way. Don't, don't litigate us. That, that, that shows you that you're, you're not a partner. And, and it's just short-sighted on your part to not, to not be part of this. Do you see what's going on out there? We are inundated with people on our streets. And I don't want to get into Quincy's get, taking this from this, we're taking that from Quincy. It's everybody, this is a regional problem. I'm asking you to be a leader that you're elected to do, and I know a lot of your people don't, I don't think anybody wants it out there, but some no, people I, did not, come up to me and say they, is, they uh, wanted this. We need to do this as a state. Boston Public Health is going to have a hand in this. The state's going to have a hand in this. It's going to, we have an opportunity to do something finally here. We, we might be able to get in front of this thing here. And we're not talking about, from what I've heard, we're not talking about just putting detox beds out there. We're talking about the people that when they've graduated through the detox program, please help us. Well, I guess the question is you can also help yourself. You've been very successful with uh, Camp Harborview using ferry service, yet there's no talk of alternative transportation or even but, using but ferry you know, service. But you know to build and to do it right, we need to do the bridge first. The no, bridge comes first. No, you need first. to have the proposal put together first so you can explain to people what you're doing. Okay, and then so ask, when we, then when we get then that ask proposal for the together, when we get that proposal together, we'll come, we'll come and give it to you, and then... I'd love then, to see it. It's more than... I, it's, I find it hard to believe you're going to spend $150 million without seeing that proposal. But conversely... You know, that island can be used right now, arguably. There's a pier head there you could fix up. Ferry service is uh, you, few and far between but, but 62 we're, we're years. At, we're at a point where we need to do all forms of transportation. We need the bridge. We need ferries. We need whatever else we can do. Well, you don't there. seem to be talking Please about anything stay. else but a bridge, so that's obviously the bridge is first. a little bit of a problem. The bridge is first. 
the bridges first. And it's unfortunate that you as a leader and you, someone that's in law enforcement, you see the problem. And you're going to stand here like I, this. As I'm going to stand here as a member of a community who has obviously dealt with Boston well over three decades. I mean, yeah, I hate to get... You said we were never good neighbors at, at You're the not. Meeting. You used to bring bombs into the community. That stopped in the 80s. Uh, when you had to renovate the uh, shooting range, never got the local permits, just went out and did the work and said, oh, sorry. When it came time to ask the, we could uh, use the island during the tall ships, denied access because the VIPs from Boston were put out there. And conversely... You know, when, when was... In 84, that was? 80, when I was think, that? 80, I believe. Okay, yeah, good. So okay, that's, that's three... That's ancient three. history. Let's... let's but I'm just going to—I'm going to ask you, as a public official, I, I, the 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 Methadone Mile is my district. That's what I deal with every day. I deal, and hopefully I deal we'll, with hopefully we'll open pick it drug up. use all day. We have 1,500 people a day from communities outside of Boston coming in to get methadone in on in on uh, down on Southampton Street. We're asking for help from a surrounding community that's suffering with the same thing that we're suffering for. And you're standing there talking about 1984. I think it's no. short-sighted. <laughs> I think that uh, it's short-sighted not to involve people and try to shove something down the road just because we can't vote for you. That's really what's happening. It, it's it got nothing. Not to do with who can, who can vote for me or not. But, but we need to build that bridge, and you guys need to get on board. Short-sighted to sit here, to, 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 to threaten with litigation now, short-sighted. And you're in law enforcement. You see who we're putting away. We, uh, ironically, we try not to put people away. Hmm? I said we try not to put people away. We try to get them help. We need places for help. Thank sure. you, Mr. Chair. <laughs> Councillor Edwards. My uh, comments very, very brief. Uh, I think my colleagues have already emphasized that we need the beds, we need the space. But I just wanted to address some of the, one of your initial comments about us doing our job. You know, I think part of our job is not only looking at the budget, but we do hold the mayor and uh, we are stewards of our financial future in Boston. And as you mentioned, Bostonians are the ones who are paying for this. And I just wanted to also note that part of our job is to look at infrastructure throughout and we are investing in infrastructure, and I think it would, would be derelict on our part not to invest in the upgrade and making sure that all points of contact to Boston or anything that we're interested in building has the infrastructure to support it. That's one of the biggest critiques we have right now is that we're building without certain levels of infrastructure. So in as much as we're going to move on this campus, which I fully support, and making sure that we have more beds and making sure that people who need them are able to access them, for us to not invest in infrastructure, be it through the ferry, be it on the bridge, would, not, would be us not doing our jobs. So I, I, I don't understand. Also, the threat of litigation, I take that very seriously as an attorney, but I also think it's very irresponsible. Again, this is the beginning of a conversation about how we're going to solve a regional problem. I think your knee-jerk reaction is irresponsible, and I suggest you do your job, too. Well, I think when you try to throw the bridge down our throat, is, uh, is an indirect reaction. Council Wasabi George. Thank you, uh, Chairman, and, and thank you for being here today. I will, um, I will respond in kind to my colleagues that we have asked these questions, we've continued to ask these questions about the future of Long Island, about the process of building this bridge, about the services that will be occurring on the island and the involvement of the City Council, as well as the region in that work. Uh, myself, Councillor Baker, Councillor Campbell have called for a hearing order particular to Long Island and particular to that process. And as chair of the Committee on Homelessness, Mental Health and Recovery, we in the City of Boston are carrying the burden for not just the region, for very much of the, the East Coast. And that includes many residents who come from the City of Quincy. Every single night we do a census in our shelters. And every single night we have residents from the city of Quincy who are unable to access a bed in your city. And they're often un unable to access a bed in your city because the, the barriers are much too high. And so they are left only with coming to Boston because we are, we are doing this work and we are caring for people. And I think Councillor Baker said it the best. We need help in this. We need your help, not your roadblocks. Uh, and I certainly hope that Quincy isn't planning on building a wall around its city to block access for residents of both the city of Boston and the city of Quincy, as well as the rest of the region, to get care and get treatment um, there. It is um, actually Quincy has the second most uh, residents who claim the community of origin to be Quincy that are in our shelters every single night in the city of Boston. And, and conversely, you're probably aware that we're the only shelter 
between Boston and Brockton. Quincy has the largest homeless shelter as well on the South Shore, and we don't discriminate on who we take into the shelter either. So, I mean, arguably, could you all this- You do have great <laughs> barriers to accessing your shelter system in the city of Quincy. Yeah, as compared to Boston. As compared to Boston. Thank you. Is that it? Thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Morris. I appreciate it. I think, it. you know, Boston is paying for the bridge, replacing the bridge, I might add. It's not a new bridge, it's replacing an old bridge. And I think there's a tremendous opportunity for us as uh, neighbors, uh, cities, very closely aligned to provide those services on an, a regional approach rather than just coming out with defenses right now. I just want well, to Well, I do the other way. I think that opportunity had always been open, but when you push it down someone's throat well, without input, that- I don't think we're that, doing that, sir. All due me. respect. We, I know we, the we mayor has outlined several outreach efforts and meetings uh, to, to advance this cause. So I, I, I look forward well, to the continued dialogue, but I would ask that Quincy keep an open mind and look at this as an opportunity rather than an attack. Well, the, uh, the bridge went down and a couple of years passed, and the first mention of the proposal that I understand was a phone call to the mayor the night before the inaugural address. So I have to think, you've already hired an engineering design firm without any input from your neighbor. And, and, but uh, there is there's a long way to go before we. Well, and that's why uh, I'm here just to say. Hopefully, you'll continue to the ask ocean. the difficult it's a questions. Long time and I, to go. I welcome and the we hearing. We need to keep engaging, but I but I I would hope that you can find a place to at least be open to this idea because of the severity of this crisis that hits your city as hard as our city. So uh, I, I, I don't no, want to no, keep I, this going. I'm open for using the island tomorrow people. by ferry service. I mean, why don't we try it? Why well, don't we get going? We're going to look into that as well. I think that was brought up, so I, I don't want to be redundant. I have many people waiting. I appreciate. I appreciate uh, the time, time, Mr. Chairman. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. DA. Um, Philomene Leptista, and I appreciate your patience. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Philemon Laptis, and I'm the executive director for Bowdoin Street Health Center. We are a hospital licensed community health center in the Bowdoin Geneva neighborhood of Dorchester. Uh, we serve over 11,000 patients, and um, we have about 43% African American Caribbean Islanders, 40% Cape Verdean, 12% Caucasian, and the remainder are made up of uh, Vietnamese and also. Um, uh, uh, other uh, patients. Um, we are a member of the Neighborhood Trauma Team, uh, which is funded by through the Boston Public Health Commission, and we are partners with the Greater Four Corners Action Coalition in Dorchester. Uh, the Neighborhood Trauma Team is a network of community health centers and community-based organizations that work with community residents who have experienced trauma due to violence, gun violence, um, in their neighborhood. Uh, for Bowdoin Street in particular, our uh, partnership is with the Greater Four Corners Action Coalition again, and once we are alert to an incidence of violence, we are deployed uh, as a team and we go out to the community residents, we door knock, we engage residents uh, on whatever their concerns are and we try to come up with an action plan in addition to that. Uh, we also work with the family members who, with the, who are the victims of homicides and we work closely with them to provide trauma services through social work and also a family partner. Um, I'd like to thank the City Council, the Mayor, the Boston Public Health Commission for your support and in the investment of this program. As you know, violence and trauma can have an enormous detrimental impact on an individual, and it is our duty as a community health center to make sure we work towards uh, making our community safer and healthier. As a Dorchester resident and a provider in the neighborhood, I myself has, have experienced the loss of a loved one to violence in the community. and. Um, Nearly half the incidents that were reported occurred in our community over the last year. Right now, we are able to respond to only a small portion of the violent incidents in Dorchester. We went from having five community health centers uh, for as part of the trauma team to being the only um, community health center or team in the Dorchester uh, neighborhood. Um, I am very grateful for you uh, creating an opportunity to expand the trauma team in Dorchester to include an additional uh, uh, community health center. So I would like to thank you for that support and I look forward to a continued partnership in working with the city as well as our community residents on addressing the issues of trauma and violence in Dorchester. 
Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Kong Chen, Fred Nenton Newton. Somebody that lives at 624 University Park, Rochester, Dorchester. Is anybody? Good afternoon. Um, Good afternoon. I know some of you know me, but my name is Fred Newton. I'm the president and CEO of Hope House. Um, Hope House Incorporated, we are down just a block off of uh, Mass Ave on Melnia Cass Boulevard. Um, actually, our, our real address is Farnham Street, a side street right there. Anyway, I'm here really because I think I really share the vision that, that somebody mentioned that the mayor had of, of just a campus where everybody or anybody that wants help can go to. Uh, you know, I kind of envision it hopefully to have the levels of care necessary to move from one to the other. Um, you know, uh, just as an example, yesterday I, I had my lunch and I walked the two blocks around Hope House and picked up 23 needles. Um, we got to get it away from my guys. I got 95 uh, men in residential treatment right there that have to navigate that every day. And, you know, seeing a needle could be a death knell to them. It just triggers people um, to want to use. And so, we, we got to be able to put people into treatment. Um, and if we could do that and take them out of the city for a little while, a breath of fresh air, um, you know, because the guys I deal with are not going to be able to get clean on Mass Ave. That, that just is not going to happen. There's just too many distractions and too many, too much stuff going on. So if the beds are there, and you know, we need a lot of beds at a lot of different levels. And if this is the start, that would be wonderful because the, the outreach workers, and I know there's other um, items in the budget uh, for outreach workers and, and for the engagement center and things like that. And so right now, if you're an outreach worker and you walk up to somebody and they say they need, that they want help, you might not be able to do anything for them. You know, and you just, that's like, sorry. You know, if you don't die next Tuesday, maybe I can help you. And, and we just can't help that. Uh, you know, I know that it's a lot of money, but how much is a life worth? How much is, is one of our children's lives? You know, uh, it costs money to live today, you know, and to treat people. And, and it's worth every nickel if we, if we get it up and start to save lives. Because I could go to four funerals a week. Um, so I really hope that, um, you know, the, de the, de the devil is in the details, right? But again, if we, uh, the vision, of going into a medical detox, stepping down, stepping down, and especially even like a, a, like a long-term transitional housing program out there too, because when somebody comes off of, uh, off of Mass Ave, even six months of treatment or eight months of treatment, it's probably not enough. Probably not enough if they just spent a number of years um, doing what, what they do. So I really hope that um, that everybody will pull together. And I, apparently it is a little bit contentious. Um, but if everybody pulls together, I'm sure that we can, we can all do it. And who, who runs the programs and stuff like that? As long as they're credible people, that's all that matters. That's all that matters. So I'm really grateful for the opportunity to express my thoughts. And I wish you all well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fred, and thank you Any for questions? all you do. The Councilor Flaherty had. Just, uh, the chair. So just on behalf of the City Council, Fred, I just want to thank you for, for uh, all the work that you do and all the work that Hope House does. We appreciate the partnership. Uh, not a week has gone by on the Council since I've been a member here where I haven't reached out to folks like yourself and others for treatment and recovery, uh, beds, um, you know, for, for everyone, for adolescents, for, for young girls, for adults, for grandparents. So um, the opioid crisis is has taken its toll on our city. We're also welcoming, as Councilor Baker had referenced a while ago, that um, you know, it's all walks of life are coming to Boston uh, in search to get high and also in search to get treatment and recovery. And 
and we don't deny uh, those opportunities for folks. And in many instances, it's, it's a strange phenomenon, as you see it, uh, speaking from, from uh, whether it's the Gavin House and the Cushing House, which are in my neighborhood. More often than not, you have to get the individual out of that environment, Thank out you. of their hometown, out of where their relationships, their connections, where their hookups are, and send them to other places. And that gets lost in the opioid crisis. It seems that Boston's always being asked to do more. We're being asked to do more on the affordable housing crisis. We're being asked to do uh, more on the job creation front. We're being asked to do more on the opioid crisis. Cities and towns across the Commonwealth have to step up to the plate, have to meet us halfway, have to join us, because our kids, the kids in our neighborhoods, they need a place to for detox recovery for halfway and for three quarter, just like we're accepting uh, you know, uh, men and women from, from other communities. And it, it, it's because of that reason. If you're a kid, and I'll just use Quincy as an example, if you're a Quincy kid and you're getting high in Quincy and your hookups and your drug relationships are in Quincy, your success rate of detoxing in Quincy is probably not going to be that great. We got to get you out of there. We got to put you down in Falmouth. We got to put you out to to, to Marlboro or, or, or up north uh, to to Melrose. That we have a fighting chance for. And same can go for all of our respective communities. If you're a kid that's living in the city of Austin, we got to try to get you out of that area. And as a result of which, there's got to be some type of reciprocal um, behavior with one another to, to make sure that we're, uh, we're all dealing with this uh, appropriately. So, but again, uh, the Hope House has done great work. Uh, you've done great work. Your colleagues uh, throughout the treatment and recovery world have done great work. And we appreciate the partnership and the friendship. And we call upon you often. And usually it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's right before close of business on Friday. <laughs> and we're trying to find treatment and recovery. We're trying to find an available bed uh, for, for a kid, for a family. Uh, and you guys never shy away from taking that phone call and, and, and you work magic, you work miracles, and we're grateful for that. Thank you. It, it ha does have to be that multi-pronged effect. Please say hello to my good friend Brian Tullis, too. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I will sure. do that. Go ahead. Fred, thank you for, for what you do. Thank Fred you. mentioned a, a point um, that if someone's an intravenous drug user for, let's say, five years or ten years, it's going to take them multiple years to just, to, to just get their head on straight. And that's what I think we have an opportunity to, to, to deliver here in this campus is for that person that has gone through Fred's program but now needs, now needs to just become human again. So, so, so maybe our charge as as a city council is to, to is to, to to urge the administration to, to to come up with our plan for what that campus is going to look like. Then we can go and and we can deliver it to to people that are are trying to block us. But Fred, great work. Same as what Michael said. You've helped me on multiple times, and 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 you're one of the best programs that's out there. So thank you. Thank you. I thank appreciate you. it. Thank you. Yomari Cordero. Linda Foster, Alexandra Zulanga. Buenas tardes. Hi. Mi nombre es Yomari Cordero. Llegué de Puerto Rico por el huracán María a través de una amiga. Luego de ahí tuve que irme a la calle con mi hijo de seis años. Él estudia en la escuela pública de Boston. Después de estar en la calle, pasé un hotel. Me ayudaron para el bulto, lápices, todos los materiales, abrigos, cena de pavo, regalos de Navidad. Me ayudaron para transferir mi plan 8 aquí en Boston. Son muchas cosas y me gustaría que a personas como yo, ellos los continúen, los continúen ayudando las escuelas públicas de Boston. Quiero darle las gracias a Sonia y a Arilín, que siempre han dicho presente. Gracias por su atención, muchas bendiciones y buenas tardes. Gracias. Gracias. Good afternoon. My name is Jomari Cordero. I came from Puerto Rico due to Hurricane Maria through a friend of mine. From there, I was on the streets with my six-year-old son. He goes to the Boston Public Schools. After being on the street, I moved into a hotel. The Boston Public Schools helped me with his backpack, pencils, all the supplies, coats, Thanksgiving turkey dinner, Christmas gifts. They helped me transfer my Section 8 to Boston. They helped with so many things. I would like for the Boston Public Schools to continue helping people like me. I want to thank Sonia and Erilyn for always being there. Thank you for listening. Many blessings, and have a good afternoon. Hi. 
My name is Linda Miller Foster, and I'm here with Alex Sulaga. We're both from NOAA, the Neighborhood of Affordable Housing, which is a bilingual nonprofit CDC organization located in East Boston. We serve over 2,100 individuals every year. We have a number of different housing programs and social services lines. One of these is the Rental Housing Counseling Emergency Housing Assistance Program for City of Boston residents, or EHAP. The majority of the clients that we see through the program uh, are people of very low income, families, and who are experiencing a sudden housing crisis situation through no fault of their own. We ask that the city found funding for this type of programming be increased in the next year through additional emergency housing assistance funds. And we thank you so very much for all of your past support. You've been supporting us in this programming for over 30 years now. Uh, a little bit about NOAA, with the help of the city, um, we've been offering this free bilingual program um, to Boston residents, helping them to either stay in their current homes and avoid homelessness, or once they are homeless, to find new rental homes. We also help people who've been displaced but don't currently have the resources or abilities to find a new unit right away. And we help them first to obtain a roof over their heads as soon as possible, even if it's temporary shelter, and then look to help them on the path to long-term housing stability. Um, our goal ultimately is to put residents who become suddenly homeless um, on a path to avoid long-term homelessness and to help them find secure housing as soon as possible. And I would just like to add that over the 30 years that we've been offering this program line, we've seen the number of clients coming to us um, really grow. The, the numbers have risen significantly. Whereas in years past, we might have served 100 clients a year. Uh, just in this current year, from January through March, we served 100 clients. So it's really increased. And now Alex is going to say more. Thank you. Hello. Um, so at NOAA, we have a special focus on assisting tenants who have been displaced, again, through no fault of their own due to a fire, natural disaster, eviction, or condemnations. Um, since January 2016, we've distributed over 68 resettlement grants directly to new landlords to assist Boston fire victims in paying their first and last month's rent or moving costs. Um, these are most often working families who earn um, below 60% AMI, average median in income. They work in fast food restaurants, warehouses, hotels, security guards, as in home health care aides, in hospitals, at dry cleaners and convenience stores, at airports, at universities, really folks from all over our community. Um, in one case, Ms. N, who works as an office assistant, experienced a fire which completely destroyed her home and all her belongings. Um, we helped her and her three children obtain their new apartment home. Um, similarly, Mr. R, who works as a security guard and his family of four, were all again displaced by a fire. Um, we were able to move them into their new home promptly by paying their first and last month's rent. Um, and in another situation, Ms. K was a widow working as a home health aide and also lost her, phone, her home and all her belongings due to a fire. We were able to move her to a new apartment home. In each of the 68 cases, these low and moderate income Boston families became suddenly homeless due to fire, building collapse, or a similar emergency situation. All were able to be rehoused through this program. And six, since 2016, we also have placed nearly 400 clients in short-term hotel stays after their Red Cross stay ended in an effort to um, elongate their process for finding affordable housing in the city of Boston. Thank you. Uh, Candice Gartley, David Martin, Tom Callahan. Good afternoon, counselors. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to be here today. Uh, my name is Candace Gartley. I am the executive director of All Dorchester Sports and Leadership, uh, and I am a Dorchester uh, resident. I live in Codman Square. Um, I've been heading up ADSL for about five years now, but the organization has been around since 1983. Um, I'm here to speak to you today on behalf of the parks budget, uh, and what I wanted to tell you is um, ADSL sits on a, uh, a field 
in uh, town field in Fields Corner, Dorchester, and we have about six acres and we occupy a field house. Um, and what we've been trying to do is re-energize this field. Uh, it, as many of you may know, it does come with some issues when the sun goes down and my job has been to try to promote and uh, get positive activities in there. Um, my other role is a member of the uh, Boston Parks Advocate and I'm sort of the small potato seat there and I represent the small neighborhood park. And what I, I wanted to put a face on uh, the needs for the parks budget this year. Um, for example, we, um, in our field house, which the parks department owns, um, we've been raising money to try to upgrade our electricity because the parks, they are spread so thin and they do yeoman's work trying to keep the place going. Um, we can't run a computer and an air conditioner at the same time because it'll blow fuses. So you know, we do the best we can. I spend most of my time trying to raise funds to keep the doors open and the lights on. And any help by approving the parks budget uh, would be very, very much appreciated. It would mean a lot to this part of Dorchester, which is really underserved. So many uh, youth organizations have closed, four of them in the last year in the neighborhood, and there's not that many places where kids can get outside um, and have positive activities, get away from the computers, and um, just interact with, the, with, with uh, others in their neighborhood. So I'm hoping you consider um, the parks budget. It'll, it would help us tremendously grow Dorchester, which is now an, an incredible rebirth, um, and it would help me do my job and provide more opportunities for the kids in our neighborhood to come to the park and enjoy what we have to offer. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Oh, um, Candace, can I ask you a quick question? Yeah. Yep. Um, do, uh, what part, first of all, thank you for all the work that you mm -hmm. do. My kids have participated in some right. of the programming that you've uh, run. What is the price tag for the field house or for the electrical work? Do you have um, a dollar amount in yes. particular? Um, uh, we have, I just submitted a grant for $15,000 to upgrade the electric. Um, the plumbing is going to be a lot more. We need a roof. I'm also uh, angling to get some CPA dollars, but that will come um, probably not another year or so. I should say we have increased our participant numbers exponentially. We're now up to 900 kids we serve a year, and three years ago we had 145. Um, so we're moving as fast as we can to try to upgrade the house so we can accommodate the additional numbers. And I know uh, I've worked with the commissioner. He has been so supportive and wonderful, but the money is just not there right now. And I know we're just a small piece of the park's budget, but I thought, you know, it is, it's sort of a human story on how our green spaces can affect the quality of life. Um, that's one of it. And boy, I could tell you, if I could use that money to put into our programs instead of, um, you know, putting more, uh, upgrading the structure of the brick on the outside of our building to prevent flooding, I'd much rather spend it on programming than, than the, uh, you know, the capital improvements. And then one more quick question. You re referred to yourself as a small potato member of the park, Boston Park mm -hmm. Advocates. Could you just... Why do you feel that way? Well, I sit on with, with pretty awesome people, the Emerald Necklace, the Hat Shell, uh, Franklin Park Coalition, um, and I... It's such an honor to be sitting at the table with them, um, and I'm also pleased to be able to bring a different you know, perspective, sort of a day-to-day -day perspective, but I know um, I appreciate the work that my colleagues are doing and to try to really provide innovative ways to have people get out and, and enjoy the outdoors. I know with so many buildings going up around Boston, there's, there's not much green space. It's not the first thing you think of when you're developing a neighborhood. So um, to be able to sit at the table and try to promote that type of a healthy environment is something that I'm, I'm, I'm delighted to uh, be part of. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Jenny Valdez, Corey Turner, Lydia Lowe. Hi. Um, thank you. My name is Tom Callahan. I'm the executive director of the Mass Affordable Housing Alliance based in Dorchester. And um, Candace described herself small potato. That She's one of the small potatoes that is the reason why we have the Community Preservation Act, because um, her organization embraced that and uh, was a great uh, partner in um, that vote two years ago. Um, I'm here today to talk about um, DND's budget, the Department of Neighborhood and Development, specifically the um, uh, resources that are going to affordable home ownership. Um, 
We support, uh, my understanding is DND has proposed, um, the mayor has proposed a new $500,000 for down payment assistance, an additional 500,000 down payment assistance, which we obviously support for low and moderate income first time home buyers. Um, I don't have to tell you, uh, but I will just in, uh, for a few seconds uh, indulge me of saying, you know, last year we graduated as an organization 850 home buyers. Far too many of them are buying, are either not buying because of the prices or buying in places like Brockton, Taunton, as far away as Attleboro, um, because they would choose, they would prefer to stay in Boston, but they are being priced out of the city. So um, we also have taken a look at the, the support the city has provided um, for affordable home ownership, for, for affordable housing units over the last four years. 91% um, of the affordable units that have been supported by the city are, are rental. 9% are home ownership. Um, we clearly have a crisis for renters, um, so I'm not here today to say that there should be less support going for affordable rental. Clearly not, that we need all of that support. But we need to expand the pie so that home ownership can get a proportionate share. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean 50-50, but a proportionate share of, of the resources. The city's on its own. Um, the federal government doesn't fund home ownership. The state government under the Baker administration has not funded, they've funded zero dollars for affordable home ownership. They have not been a partner with, um, with the city at all for affordable home ownership. The, the two developments, 88 Harrison and Mosaic, were funded under the previous administration and, and obviously have just opened, but, but those were funded under the past administration. So we've gone almost four years now without a home ownership funding round. So the city is really on its own. Um, we're um, hoping to see a bunch of you on June 12th for our Expand the Pie meeting. You will leave with a pie, just to remind you that we're trying to expand the pie. Um, it's a mini pie, so don't get too excited. <laughs> But how many times have you made that promise? You know, come to a meeting, get a pie. Um, so, uh, but I specifically wanted to support DND's efforts to push home ownership. Um, it has a particularly, um, I think, negative effect on the city when we're losing our home buying population of a certain income uh, to other communities. Um, it also has a racial impact. Um, we uh, disproportionately. Um, Black and Latino uh, tenants um, don't get a chance to move into home ownership. We already have a racial home ownership gap. 44% of our white residents are homeowners, 29% of our black residents, and 16% of our Latino residents are, are homeowners. So there already is an existing gap, um, and the current housing cost crisis is making that gap um, even wider. and. Um, unless we are intentional about our resources and our policies to try to close that gap, um, I think we're gonna uh, be here in future years saying uh, we've lost an opportunity, we lost a generation of potential home buyers in the city. So I thank you thank as you. council for your support. Thank you very thank much, Tom, you. and uh, Council Flair. Thank you, Tom, obviously on behalf of the council, uh, wanna um, uh, thank you for your past uh, and continuing support for the Community Preservation Act. Uh, did phenomenal work with your organization, and uh, happy to say that the first round of uh, yes. commitments are coming out. There'll yeah. be a vote, I yeah. believe, this evening uh, with respect to right. creation of affordable housing, senior housing, veteran housing, uh, store preservation, uh, open space preservation. So, lots of good stuff in that. But it was, uh, you know, your uh, perseverance and continued dogged um, efforts on behalf of the uh, of the referendum that was. Uh, that's why we're here. And so speaking for myself and my colleagues, uh, uh, multi-berry, as long as it's under 50 bucks, will be uh, be a nice pie. So look forward to seeing you there. Well, let me remind folks that it was a 12-1 vo vote of this body right. to put it on the ballot. So thank you no. for that. Uh, I know some of you weren't here, but you would have voted for it. <laughs> um, so that got the whole campaign started. Without that, um, right. we'd still be talking about it. No. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you. you. Uh, Zoe Cronin. Russell Furter, Annette Dole, Duke, Duke, sorry, Duke. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. My name is uh, David Martin. I'm the Executive Director of the Massachusetts Health Council. 
Uh, the Health Council is a statewide advocacy and programmatic organization that advocates for the health and wellness of every person in every community in the Commonwealth. So thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. The Massachusetts Health Council has always worked very closely with the Boston Public Health Commission uh, to enable healthier lifestyles, wellness, and preventative care uh, so that all people in all communities can thrive. Thanks to an investment from Mayor Walsh, the Boston Public Health Commission will be able to launch a new marijuana communications campaign aimed at prevention messages for youth and other vulnerable populations. Uh, and since marijuana has been legalized, it is critical that we provide families and young adults with clear and easily accessible information about the effects of using legal marijuana. Uh, the Mass Health Council recently held a conference called Our Kids and Drugs of Misuse uh, just last week, uh, where we talked about the reality of legal marijuana uh, because hundreds and hundreds of teachers uh, and school administrators and other people who work with youth showed up because they are desperate for this information about what do we tell our kids about the new world of legal marijuana. Um, we're in the midst of this opioid crisis, there are, uh, and yet we legalize marijuana, and so we have a lot of conflicting messages that we're telling our kids. So the funds the mayor has designated for marijuana youth prevention communication, very important. We urge you to support this funding. Uh, thank you again for your support. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Jenny Valdez, and earlier today you heard about the um, Boston Neighborhood Trauma Team, specifically in Dorchester. Um, today I'm here upon all neighborhood trauma teams. I'm from the Jamaica Plain Neighborhood Trauma Team, and I do direct services um, working with victims of um, crimes and families and um, any other referrals received through the community. So um, I wanted to share that exactly one month ago, we had a double homicide in Center Street. Um, and I was, I with many other um, members of the trauma teams um, did direct work with both families um, and, and residents in the community. Um, to be specific, Jamaica Plain Neighborhood Trauma Team, Boston Trauma Response Team, and many other agencies responded that night and did tremendous work that night and the day after um, with affected individuals. As the family partner of the team, not only did I work directly with both families that lost their loved ones, making sure that they received appropriate services, but also received 13 referrals from the community, residents who witnessed and affect, were affected by community violence and trauma not only that day, but any other day. I'm here today to address the importance of this work and the positive impact it has on residents. I, many days I get um, messages from clients or patients and, re and they remind me of how rewarding it is to be part of, to be working with me um, as, as their family partner and getting them services such as um, connecting them back to the behavioral health centers and getting them actual safety transfers. Um, so I wanna thank the investments included in Mayor's Walsh budget, the Boston Public Health Commission, um, and that they will be able to expand this um, neighborhood trauma team in Dorchester. Um, I wanna say thank you again and to continue supporting this great work that we have in our community and city of Boston. Thank you. Thank you. You're next. Go ahead. Hi, I'm Lydia Lowe, and I'm here on behalf of the Friends of the Chinatown Library. And um, I just wanted to speak in favor and in support of the allocations to the Boston Public Library. I think that it's been it's um, been so important to have not only a beautiful central branch, a central library, you know, which um, I was, you know, lucky to be at the opening of, but also that there's been real investment in the branches, and um, the branches are just so important um, for you know our neighborhoods, for you know kids um, getting on track with reading, um, for elderly having a place to go. And um, we are especially grateful that, you know, after so many decades that we finally have a Chinatown branch library. Even though this is an interim library, um, it's already surpassed everyone's expectations in terms of usage. And, you know, we're also looking forward to and appreciate that there is a study for um, a permanent library, you know, um, being invested as well. Um, since I happen to be here and listening to other testimony, um, I also want to support, you know, allocations for uh, Department of Neighborhood Development. 
Uh, we need that and more. And I, you know, as I was listening to Tom Callahan um, speak about home ownership, I just wanted to raise, you know, another issue, which is not just specifically budgetary, but it's just, you know, that I think it is worthwhile for the city to really look into community land trusts as a home ownership strategy to increase home ownership and to really keep homes um, affordable for the long run because it costs so much for us to build every new home, but community land trust through collective ownership that keeps homes permanently affordable is a way um, that we can increase ownership options, you know, without having to do additional new construction. Um, that can often be, you know, more reasonable to just preserve what we have. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Councillor Flynn. Yeah, thank you, Councillor um, Siomo. And I just want to say thank you to Lydia and the people from Chinatown for never giving up on the dream to open up a public library. They fought for 50 years. But thanks to the efforts of Mayor, Mayor Walsh and his administration, we do have a temporary library in Chinatown. It's about 1,500 square feet. The community loves it. And I uh, had an opportunity to talk to the mayor over the weekend, and I know he's 100% committed to uh, continuing to look at spaces to build a permanent library in Chinatown. So we're very proud of um, the mayor for his dedication and his, his commitment. And we're also proud of the people for, of Chinatown for never giving up on that dream. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Hi, everybody. So my name is Zoe Cronin. I'm the managing attorney at Greater Boston Legal Services Housing Unit. And I'm here to uh, show support for the Department of Neighborhood Development's Office of Housing Stability and their budget requests. In particular, the increase of $125,000 for the legal assistance for eviction programs. Um, Greater Boston Legal Services and all of Civil Legal Aid has worked really closely with the Office of Housing Stability since it's been started. And I just wanted to highlight a couple of the things that they've done that have been really key and what could be done with the additional 125000 So two years ago, Greater Boston Legal Services, working together with many city agencies and CDCs, um, was able to turn 49 evictions of low-income tenants into 49 units of permanently affordable housing in Dorchester and Mattapan. And this was a huge victory um, that saved tons of vulnerable tenants who otherwise would have been displaced. What the OHS did is help us quickly get multifinancing to save those tenancies. Um, they worked with the housing authority to reinstate Section 8 vouchers. The power of the city to assure that this deal was going to work out was really key to its success, and it helped stabilize um, the tenancies through the transition in ownership from a notorious slumlord to being owned by a CDC that promised to keep the properties permanently affordable. In addition, OHS really helps out with emergency displacement, as I think some of the testimony from NOAA shows. When there's a fire or a building collapses, we can count on it that the tenants that we represent um, will be placed in hotels immediately, get first, last, and security deposit to move, and be able to transition safely to a new home. And then finally, we've really relied on the mediation services provided by OHS. Um, it means a lot strategically that the city is really willing to put an arm and of its government and its clout behind a case, especially in the gentrification type evictions where folks are really being thrown out of their homes. And we need a serious place to come, a place with gravitas to say this, is, this shouldn't happen. Um, these are Boston residents who deserve to stay in their homes and OHS provides that for them. With an, in, with an additional 125,000 investment, we would be able to stop many evictions around the city of Boston. Um, an example of someone that Civil Legal Aid has assisted is Ms. Pineda. She is a single mom. She is very disabled and has a disabled daughter. They were living in an absolutely run-down, tiny apartment that actually had no lock on the door at all. It was overrun with mice, and they paid only $500 in rent. They were facing eviction for no reason at all, a no-fault eviction, because the landlord wanted to um, rehab the building. They were really scared they were going to be out in the street, and the landlord was only offering them a few weeks to get out. 
because of the stress of the eviction, the mom and her daughter were starting to decompensate as all the past traumas of their life were sort of highlighted in this new situation. Once Civil Legal Aid got involved working with OHS, we were able to tell her that she was not going to become homeless and she and her daughter were not gonna be in the street. And working together, we were able to help her transition to public housing and also have the money to move and make that transition safely. So with $125,000, we would be able to help many more people um, and get them into stability. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Russell Engler. I teach at New England Law Boston, and I serve on the Massachusetts Access to Justice Commission. I also am here speaking in favor of the uh, budget item of $125,000 for legal assistance for eviction prevention. In, by taking this step, Boston, Boston can t continue to step forward and join the growing list of cities that has begun to recognize that a commitment to legal services for eviction defense is a crucially important policy for preserving affordable housing and increasing housing stabilization. New York City, Newark, Philadelphia, Washington, Denver, San Francisco are among the cities that have dramatically increased their resources because so many tenants do not have lawyers. When they get lawyers, they are able to stay in their homes or find equivalent affordable housing. You may be aware that in 2017, New York City became the first city in the country to create a right to counsel for tenants facing eviction. But that's not where they started. They first started by increasing the money for eviction defense. And what did they, they find? Prior to that allocation of money, only 1% of the tenants had representation. That figure jumped to 27%. Evictions citywide plummeted by 24%. 24% with representation. As a result, there were tremendous cost savings for the government and a significant amount of trauma avoided for the families that are ripped apart by eviction. Just from a monetary level, a Massachusetts statewide task force found that for every dollar spent on eviction prevention services, governments save $2.69. New York City found the figures were much higher, between $5 or $10 saved in government funding from eviction avoided, from the averted costs in the healthcare system, the averted costs in the juvenile justice system. So eviction present prevention and legal services is a crucial component to affordable housing. Adding this line item and whatever other commitments can be found will increase the effectiveness of the great work that the Mayor's Office on Stabilization already does. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Annette Duke. I'm a housing attorney with the Massachusetts Law Reform Institute, which is based in Boston, right up the street. Um, we're a statewide organization that works on uh, policy and advocacy concerning low-income people. Um, like my colleagues before me, I'm here to ask you to um, pass the budget with the $125,000 for the legal assistance for eviction prevention. Um, housing is. The housing crisis is not new to any of us here, um, but it certainly is heating up, and there's a whole new breed of evictions called gentrification evictions. Um, as Attorney Cronin said, with a little bit of help, folks um, who receive legal assistance can prevent these evictions, can prevent the trauma that um, causes the evictions. Um, I wanted to share with you some statistics that are um, stark. Um, and I have a handout that I'd like to give to you. I don't know how to do that. Thank you. Oh, thank you. So what I'm, I'm providing you with is statistics from the Housing Court Department. Um, and what it shows you is that in the Boston Housing Court, 92% of tenants are unrepresented. And it also shows you that 81% of landlords are represented. On the basketball court, for those of us who like to watch basketball, that's a mismatch. It's like me going up against uh, Bill Russell. You know, the, um, the balance of power is definitely weighted towards landlords who have the benefit of an attorney, 
You have a benefit of a doctor, you get um, advice from that doctor, you have a benefit of a lawyer, you can prevent and stabilize your housing. Um, these figures are very important for Boston to pay attention to. Um, your leadership in many ways um, on the housing issue has been incredible. Um, we hope that there are future things that we can do to grow an eviction prevention program. Um, as Professor Engler said, across the country, there are different ways that eviction defense is being accomplished. This is a very good first step, um, and we urge you to pass that line item. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, Councilor Edwards. So I um, just wanted to do a global kind of comment. Um, first, to thank the folks who came from NOAA and East Boston, who I, I'm happy to represent, and I from firsthand and experience have worked with them in dealing with folks in emergencies. Um, but part of that is the upstream approach to dealing with homelessness and to dealing with displacement, which then is filled in by the incredible advocates at Mass Law Reform and Greater Boston Legal Services. So I, I, I wholly support their push for the increase in budget um, as they're demonstrating over and over again is prevention and upstream is how you prevent displacement. And so what, knowing that the city could invest in a unique way in the court systems to make sure that people walking in there will be able to get legal advice, not always preventing an eviction, but at least allowing for a softer landing, mm -hmm. allowing them to negotiate fairly if they are going to have to negotiate how they exit, those are things that are worth our investment. So I, I wholeheartedly support the increase in OHS's budget, not just because I love OHS, <laughs> and not because a bit. just a little. <laughs> I'm not biased at all, <laughs> but I am. I am incredibly supportive of of these organizations, and I think their record speaks for itself. They they're there when no one else is, and they have been in the fight. Also, speaking to Lydia Lowe and, and the Chinese Progressive Association and their push for land trust, it's time to get creative, it's time to get innovative, and $125,000 is worth the investment. Great. Thank you, Councilor Thank Edwards. You. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Sarah Freeman, Abigail Forrester, and Malik Souls. Yeah, sure. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Sarah Freeman, Jamaica Plain. Um, I can't believe I'm doing this, but I'm uh, sort of having fun with a topic that isn't funny at all. And what I mean by that is um, some of you were here probably for the Parks Department budget hearing where I already spoke and listed five items. I had also submitted written comments but couldn't be here in person for the transportation hearing, then the CCE hearing, and I thought, wouldn't it be a challenge to try to make a top 10 green wish list? So I offer to you sort of cliff notes, sorry if it's repetitive, but I think it's important, um, and I'll be fast, a top 10 green wish list uh, for the city. I don't have price tags. I'm, I don't know if this will be helpful. There's a TV commercial where I can't even remember what it advertises, but it says we got more, you know, so the idea is any way you can do more on these areas would be appreciated. Um, so number 10, um, the Boston Park Rangers Mounted Unit lost six back 10 years ago, six positions. Friends group formed for a three-year bridge 10 years ago. Um, the number of acres they patrol hasn't shrunk, so uh, bringing them back, ideally three this year, three next year, and we'll have an 11-year gap in the full strength. Uh, number nine, Muddy River Restoration Project. Um, a new park opened af named after Justine Liff, the former park commissioner. Um, there's concern now that we're entering weed season, trees worried about getting water, just making sure it's maintained well, and that eyes are long-term looking at funding for finishing the project. Uh, number eight, stone walls crumbling. Neighbors asking what can we do to not step out our front door and see this deteriorating wall. Number seven, water fountains. Um, Arnold Arboretum in particular, 
Um, I mentioned it at the hearing, but also last night at the Pond, Jamaica Pond Association, a couple people also mentioned that when they're running through the Arboretum, they notice non-working, not only non-working, but non-working so long-term that they're closed off. Whoops, is that a cue that I'm? Yeah, I'm sorry for those who came late. That's um, the cue for 30 seconds uh -oh. left. Oh, okay, then I'll skip to number one and leave you um, <laughs> sorry, the written Sarah. list. That's okay. I'm trying to get everybody in. Number one, I haven't mentioned before. I live on the Arbor Way, which is a DCR road, but the city is the landowner. And it hurts when I hear people talk about completing the Emerald Necklace by connecting Franklin Park by Columbia Road because we still have breaks in the historic parks. And if you're on a JP Facebook page, there's a lot of talk today. Cars flying through fences, killing trees, like big, big damage, high speed. We need enforcement. Uh, BPD, I think, has shared jurisdiction there. And anything you can do to encourage DCR to also do their part would be greatly appreciated. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Um, may I give this? Sure. Abigail and or Malik. Hello, good afternoon. Abigail Forrester from Madison Park Development Corporation. Um, I'm here in support of the line item in the mayor's budget to expand the neighborhood trauma team um, into Dorchester. Um, over the past year, I've been a staunch supporter and leader for the Roxbury team um, that's currently funded um, for the neighborhood trauma team. We've done some effective work with families to support families who have been affected peripherally by uh, incidents of violence. Uh, quite frankly, uh, just in the, the last year, we supported over 20 two families around incidents of violence and trying to support them. One of the critical challenges, I think, um, and, and the greatness of expanding this effort is uh, we have boundaries. And I think that when we think about trauma, trauma doesn't have boundaries. And so this expansion of the neighborhood trauma team is critical in support of the efforts we're making uh, from a grassroots level um, and comprehensively between uh, community health centers, the Boston Public Health Commission, and community organizations to really address long-term trauma and be there for families who suffer from from uh, incidents of violence. Um, so I would just want to speak to the council to say, uh, please support this effort. Um, it's very critical for the families that, that are in need. Uh, and again, uh, trauma shouldn't be limited by boundaries and families getting services. Um, and this opportunity is, is critical in the mayor's effort to expand this initiative. So thank you for the support in the past, and we're hoping that this line item will be passed in the current budget. Thank you so much. Anyone else for public testimony at this time? And just because you didn't sign in, if you just state your name and I, I affiliation did. for the record. I, I did sign in. No, we but, didn't get yeah, it. Sorry. But, um, well, there you are, Barry. I'm sorry. Oh, no, no. No worries. Um, so, hi. My name is Barry Bach. I'm a... Um, residents of Roslindale and I'm also I work in the South End where I'm the CEO of Boston Healthcare for the Homeless program and um, so thank you for listening to me today I'm here really to support two items in the mayor's budget one around the engagement center um, and the other around the rebuilding of the Long Island Bridge um, we've been fortunate to work with the city around the engagement center um, and we've just had phenomenal success in working with them been very impressed that it's helped reduce some of the um, crowding in the neighborhood, offering some real support and some recovery services. Um, we think that the, um, frankly, we think the city has done just a fantastic job around both of those and the engagement center has been um, part of really that building block. The other thing I just want to talk about briefly is we first had an opportunity, or I first had my opportunity to drive across the Long Island Bridge back in 1986. Um, I've done a lot of work out on Long Island in, in both addiction and homeless services. Um, it's a, been a profound loss for us as a city. Um, and as we know, um, we've still been playing catch up since the loss of the bridge in 2014. So really want to encourage, I know $92 million is a ridiculous sum of money, um, but we also, when you think about that over the life of what the bridge would be um, and think about the ability to build a recovery campus, um, we're very much in favor of the rebuilding of the bridge. Also want to pledge our support around any fundraising efforts as well as um, service efforts um, so that uh, want to know that the city council and the mayor can count on us in both of those. Thank you for your time. 
Thank you. Sure. And anybody else for public testimony at this point? Come on down. If you just state your name for the record. Sure, my name is Meredith Cunniff. Um, I live in Quincy. Sorry, I didn't have an umbrella in my car. <laughs> I look like It I'm happens. Um, I was a nurse on Long Island. I worked at Andrew House for Bay Cove, and I was there the night of the evacuation. Um, I had 60 patients detoxing from various substances. Most of them were pretty dangerous to detox from, and at a very short amount of time, we had to evacuate. 60 of our patients and multiple other levels of care on the island also. Um, we don't really have enough space for anyone extra seeking treatment in Boston or the surrounding, even Massachusetts. Um, I noticed through the closing of Long Island, um, the overdose rate really spiked the first year after the closing. There's data, I believe, of over 1,000 people who had passed away the year of 2014 just in the Boston area. Um, so I think it's safe to say that through some of the advocacy work that I've done at the State House, I've been told that there is no room for capacity for funding. So there's not a lot of money being put into building you know, more step-down treatment beds, which is really what we're lacking, is CSS and TSS level of care. Um, we have half the amount of beds available in the step-down level of care as we do in detox. It's approximately, and don't quote me, about 900 in detox and about 425 in the lower level of care. So what that means, sorry, I'm out of breath too because I was running in the rain. Uh, so anyone really seeking treatment if those 900 detox beds are filled in Massachusetts and there's only 425 step-down beds, no one's getting placed. Uh, everyone's having to leave detox, not getting placed in longer term settings and they're passing away or they're relapsing or they're going to jail. Um, so um, I started a petition on change.org in full support of uh, reopening Long Island for treatment. And I think the bridge is definitely, you know, in, in opposition from people where I live. I live on the street leading to Long Island now and there's never been an issue with traffic or guardrails that were bumped up. I know that some of the Squanum residents are very concerned about their guardrails, which is unfortunate um, because I'm more worried about the public health crisis. But um, I'm trying to help them and educate them. So through the um, change.org petition, I assumed maybe like 35 of my friends, but it's, we're up to almost 10,000 now. And um, we're all just trying, all of us that are in, this field together. I'm just trying to educate the public so that they know over $90 million, yes, is an astronomical amount of money. Um, but I think you would save a lot of money because it costs, you know, a salary to put somebody in prison for a year. You know, it's about $60,000 a year to house one person in prison a year, whereas it would cost you probably 4000 to put them in treatment. Um, so I think we would save money in the long run by adding. So yes, 90 million is a lot of money. Um, but we're losing a generation of people. Mm -hmm. And we also have a new life expectancy that's much different for as a nation. Um, and I think it's our step down level in long term treatment that we're lacking. Um, I think it's really needed. I know. Yeah. Thank, thank you so much. And, and you. can I ask for your, you didn't sign in, I, I assume. I just you? got here and That's, I signed in over there. Okay, okay, great, because you're an ally in this, uh, hopefully not fight, right? I mean, this, this should be a partnership. And, and to your point, you come with great credibility because you live in that area too. Mm -hmm. So, you know, any way that uh, we can help support you and your efforts, I think we, we want to dialogue with the city of Quincy. We want a solution. And as I said in the previous segment, uh, this, this isn't a brand new thing. Right. This is a replacement. Right. And you worked out there. So you bring right. a great deal of thoughtfulness and, and sensibility to this issue. And I thank you for coming today. Absolutely. Anything I can do, please let me know. Thank great. You. We Thank have you. your inf contact information. That's okay. great. Thanks. Thank you. Um, at this point, anybody else? Uh, uh, sure. And if anybody did not sign up um, and wants to speak, just 
you can do that right now. Thank you. Hi. Hi. I'm Katie O'Leary. I'm the Director of Recovery Support Services for North Suffolk Mental Health. Um, and I am here in support of replacing the Long Island Bridge, as well as placing peer specialists and recovery coaches into the engagement center downtown. Um, my sister was on Long Island the night that it closed, and thank God for people like Mary, who um, you know, helped her safely get to a different treatment program. I also work at Meridian House, which is a long-term residential treatment facility in East Boston, and um, we took in a lot of the people that were displaced that night, and uh, that was about four years ago, and the two or three people that we did take in are still currently doing well to this day, so recovery is possible. Um, and I think the biggest thing is to kind of ride on what Mary was saying is that there aren't enough beds, and that campus is well needed, and um, you know, a lot of people get the services they need out there rather than congesting everybody into that downtown Mass Ave area, um, which might not be as healthy of a setting. Uh, so I just wanted to say that. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Is there anyone else again wishing to testify at this time? Seeing and hearing none. I'm going to take a little recess. This. Thank you. from oh go, go right for it do i go over here yes to that All right. podium yep we'll be expedient thank you <laughs> very good thanks marianne thank you um it's really good to be before you uh, um, as members of the city council i am the executive director of Moore Massachusetts Organization for Addiction Recovery, which is a statewide organization of people in recovery, families and friends who are educating the public about the value of recovery. And we really feel the value in our capital city of Boston and very, very glad to be here. We know that too many people are dying from overdoses and we really want to support Mayor Wasser's proposal to met an unmet need to integrate steps towards a needed seamless continuum of care. And that means get rid of the gaps, have people come in and promote recovery. Does that sound good? Good. Yep. So um, we believe in the engagement center, which was opened up. We really believe that it could, should get even more than the $1.9 million that's been suggested. Um, and to be able to support a program director with two recovery coaches and also transportation, which is so, so, so important. And PAVS, their program, which is renowned across the state as a place where you can just walk in, you're gonna be greeted with comfort and care. They need that extra support to continue what they're doing in a very positive way. And Safe and Sound Recovery Center, um, which we were um, our part of, but started off with a SAMHSA, Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration grant. They've helped so many people get into recovery, which is really, really important. And then um, the Office of Recovery Services, as you know, has, has had a grant with the Blue Cross Blue Shield Foundation to look at youth. And you know the advantage of having the support in the neighborhoods, because you represent neighborhoods, and the coalitions, which are so important to supporting the adolescents so they can be free of, of addiction. So give them the support that they need. And most importantly, because this is what you're waiting for, is the support for the Long Island Bridge to bring that structure and that foundation so that we can get over to Long Island and build up the support that's needed. One of the saddest days is when they had to close it down. Everyone was really upset. 
and all the people that had to be relocated. It was so totally miserable, and the treatment centers that were there have had to move on to other places. But now let's take this unique opportunity to invest, and as they talk about it in the recovery world, about building recovery capital in a recovery-oriented system of care where everybody is helping everyone. So this is the opportunity to build that seamless continuum of care, and more stands beside the mayor in support for this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mary Ann, and thank you for your dedication to the addiction and recovery uh -huh. services in our state. Well, you're welcome. <laughs> Very much so. Oh, I'm sorry. Councilor Question. Flynn. Yeah, and I also <laughs> wanted to thank, thank you, you. Council Siomo, and I also wanted to say to, thank you to Mary Ann for your many years of work in this field, helping right. helping people that, you know, are suffering from alcoholism and drug, drug issues. It impacts every neighborhood in the city. It impacts every family in the city. But the drug counselors across the city and across the state are really the unsung heroes Absolutely. and they do so many so many things helping people they don't look for credit they don't look for praise but they just go ahead and do their job every day every night and on the weekends and uh, we're lucky to have so many courageous drug treatment counselors in this state that really care about care about people giving them an opportunity to get into treatment so you know, we just want to say thank you oh. for what you've done for so many years. Well, thank you. Thank you very, very much. And we appreciate you. And thanks. Thanks again. Thank you, Marianne. I'm going to take another recess. <laughs> uh, my name is Dorothea Haas. I'm with Walk Boston, we're a nonprofit pedestrian advocacy organization. I'm going to be testifying uh, on, behalf, on behalf of the Boston transportation budget. Um, I want to say that Walk Boston is about 27 years old. We've been working with the city all of this time, and um, we have seen a substantial increase in the level of support for walking and other modes of transportation, such as transit and bicycling. This began under Mayor Menino and has certainly continued under Mayor Walsh. Um, especially in the last five years, we've seen um, just almost a mushrooming of support on the part of the city and also neighborhoods for complete streets, Vision Zero, um, Go Boston 2030, and the Neighborhood Slow Streets program. So I'd like um, the city council um, to build on this support. Um, when the city sent out a request for uh, proposals for neighborhood slow streets, 47 neighborhoods in the city sent in applications. Uh, the city had intended to, um, to, to finance two of those and create it, but with the groundswell of support, they did support and, and, and established five neighborhood slow streets programs. So I encourage the city council um, to, um, to build upon this momentum for walkable communities, and people think of that as livable communities in the city of Boston, which is noted for its walkability. So, um, we especially ask for your support for an increase of $5 million for the Transportation Department. This would um, support 15 to 20 new positions, and it would involve upgrading infrastructure throughout the city, and that would include sidewalks, bicycle lanes, and um, transportation for vehicles. So uh, we um, once again request your support. Uh, we think this is a very popular program. Um, and we've seen that in the neighborhoods and amongst the residents. So thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, a question? Do I wait for questions or? Um, no, that's okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, is she here? Okay. She might be out. Oh, you want? To? I'd like to recognize uh, Joanne Cataldo. Hi. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm here to speak in support of the mayor's efforts around recovery, treatment, and prevention. So I work out in East Boston coordinating a community coalition where on a very piecemeal basis, we feel like we're trying to put together a plan for the schools, 
um, certainly working with some of our homeless and addicted folks in the community, trying to help them access services. Um, part of the plan would include a recovery center, um, and as well as transportation. We find that we're somewhat isolated in East Boston, so trying to get folks from the community to treatment can often be rather challenging. Um, so that's on our adult and folks with substance use disorders. Again, to speak about the prevention part, I know that um, with support from my official funder, the Mass General Centers for Community Health Improvement, um, the city has worked with CCHI as well as the Blue Cross Foundation to put together a comprehensive prevention plan for the schools. And there are many components of that plan which should be executed and implemented, um, but without actual people to oversee it and help with the implementation throughout the city, it will unlikely happen um, or maybe just happen again in a very piecemeal way. We kind of string together funding um, to better support schools in East Boston, or I do, with the help of some folks at MGH and at the Health Center, but it is clearly not comprehensive, and that's kind of what we're hoping can happen in East Boston, of course, but throughout the city. Great. Thank so, you. Thank you. Is there anybody else uh, wishing to testify at this time? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm going to recess again briefly. And I'd like to now recognize Sarah Kiley. Um, Thank you. I'm an independent citizen. I'm a resident of Boston in Councilor Baker's district. And I, um, I have a doctorate in anthropology. And hi, Councilor Baker. <laughs> I'm a trained archaeologist. And I'm a practicing experienced forensic anthropologist. And I'm coming here today as a volunteer of the city archaeology department. Um, I've been volunteering for Joe Bagley, the staff archaeologist for the city. Uh, for a number of years now, and I testified last year about um, giving him a budget. Currently, Joe and the city archaeology department doesn't have a budget and hasn't have a, had a budget in 35 years. He has um, done some amazing things in his tenure in the last six years. You can see that just by um, checking out his Facebook. I think he has around 12,000 followers now, as well as his, his public archaeology, which he does every summer. Um, introducing visitors to the city about archaeology and the digs that he's doing throughout the city. I think he's at Paul Revere now, but he's um, done the excavations at the shipwreck in the seaport, Malcolm X's house, Old North Church, just to name a few of the highlights over the years. He does a tremendous job, and you know, I got off in seven, eight. No, I'll hold that, okay. And I'm just here to testify, testify about the need for funding for that department. Um, I noticed in the proposed budget that the Environment Department, so the City of Boston Archaeology Department, is situated in Austin Blackman, Blackman's Cabinet in Environment, and they have um, been allocated in the proposed budget $35.6 million in new capital expenditures, um, yet none was allocated to the Archaeology Department. Um, they've been denied a budget, as I mentioned, for the past 35 years in a row. So specifically, I'm here to urge the support of the city council to discuss this with the administration, to provide a modest allocation. We requested, myself and a number of volunteers last year, requested a modest allocation of 250,000 to allow him to add on a lab manager position, a permanent position. He's had a lab manager, Sarah Keklak, for a number of years that he's funded through various grants. However, that's running out at the end of June. So his longtime lab manager, who basically reigns all of the 300 plus volunteers that help the department, is going to be leaving, which is a tremendous loss, I think, for the city of Boston and for our understanding of the history of Boston. So let's see. I submitted into the record um, the Cotter Award, which was awarded by Joe's peers. Um, pardon me. <laughs> a tremendous award that he was selected by his peers for this. And in that award, he's described as a model for other cities. 
on government. So I've attached that for your review, as well as the 30 plus written documents that were submitted last year um, on behalf of Joe and supporting the city archeology span department. Um, the only other point that I'd like to make, because my time is short and I know I only have a couple minutes of your Who's time. Your companion? <laughs> yeah. Is that there's a tremendous boom in development in the city right now, and that has a lot to do with the expanded amount of work that is on Joe's plate. And you know, I've I've talked to the mayor and a few other people about different ways to generate revenue. You know, perhaps adding a one cent to the permitting cost for development. Perhaps that might be a way of of generating resources that um, could sustain it over the long term. I think there's a number of different ways to do it. But there's just a tremendous need. The administration, you know, goals of 53,000 new housing units as is 60 percent of the development boom that we're seeing in the city right now. So my concern is that without appropriate resources to meet this demand, we may lose this valuable public servant and the opportunity to collect and interpret our history. So with Thank that, I think Thank you, Joe. I'll, I'll end my testimony. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah. And your Do, companion. Of course, this is Harrison, my son. Hi, Harrison. <laughs> it's his second time here. He was here last year as well, <laughs> although not quite as mobile. Thank and you again. Please let me know if you have any questions related yeah. to that or Great. if I can be Thank of any you. assistance. I think uh, Councillor Flynn would like to say, and I just want to just say uh, jo, we, we really appreciate all the work that Joe does. It's really important work, too. Thank Great. You. Thank you. Councilor. Yeah, thank you for your testimony. It was very informative, and I learned a lot from your testimony, and um, I think it's something the city um, should consider. Um, as, as you mentioned, there's a lot of development going on in the city, and there is a, a, a need for making sure that we preserve the history of Boston. We have great history in the city. One one issue I would I would ask is maybe, are you aware of any other cities across the country that have similar positions, and would you know what their duties would be or how much they are budgeted for? Um, I don't know if like New York may have a, a similar position, um, but I'd be interested in, in learning more about it, and if I could be of any help, um, you know, I'd love to sit down and talk to you and any other volunteers as well. Excellent, thank you, Councillor. I am, um, in terms of other comparative cities, I know that New York has a state archaeologist. They also have um, employed a handful of folks like myself at the through the medical examiner's office. So they are cross-trained and they do help with archaeological components as well. Um, I'd be happy to look into that and provide city council with you know some information about that if that would be helpful. Yeah, that'd be helpful, and I could also do a little bit of research myself. And um, I think I think your proposal um, has great merit, and um, it's something I, I hope the city will consider. I hope so too. I think that it has tremendous impact both on the residents and tourism um, in the city of Boston. So thank great. you very much. Thank you, Ann Harrison. <laughs> thank you for testifying. Thank you. Council will be in recess. had uh, the full afternoon uh, open to the public for testimony. We had some great testimony throughout the day off and on. And I would just like to conclude today's hearing with thanking members of the public for all their testimony and feedback throughout this process. Uh, and also to my colleagues who uh, participated in uh, about 60 hours of hearings throughout this uh, budget season. And I particularly need to thank uh, central staff, including the folks behind me, uh, particularly Michelle Goldberg and Kate Sullivan, but also Kerry Jordan and Candace Morales behind the scenes and, and the entire central staff who uh, always provide us with all the great information that we move forward to review this fiscal year 19 budget on behalf of the taxpayers of the city of Boston. And this concludes the FY19 budget season at this time. 
Uh, we will reconvene hearings uh, in the subsequent weeks leading up to the final budget vote on June 27th. Thank you. This hearing stands adjourned.